Um, so welcome everybody and thank you for joining us as we continue the 2021 lectures in mathematics education series today. We are excited to visit with Dr. Miriam Sharon from Northwestern University. The lectures in mathematics education series is sponsored by the Herman and Rache Math, Math Initiative and the Rossier School of Education with the goal of highlighting important research targeted at improving teacher effectiveness in mathematics education. We are thankful to be able to pro provide access to this series virtually and for our guest speakers and those joining us for being flexible enough to work in this newfound digital space. Today, I am happy to introduce Dr. Sharon, who will be talking about using video to study, develop, and support teacher noticing. Dr. Miriam Sharon is the Associate Provost for Undergraduate Education and the Alice Gabriel Twight Professor of Learning Sciences in the School of Education and Social Policy Education at Northwestern University. Dr. Sharon's research seeks to improve our understanding of how teachers think and learn by examining a broad range of teacher knowledge across a variety of cognitive tasks. Most recently, her research has focused on the construct of teacher noticing, looking specifically at teachers' professional vision, the ability to identify and respond to significant events in the moments of instruction. Over the last two decades, Dr. Sharon has been at the forefront of efforts to design and study contexts that make use of video in ways that promote teacher learning. Her work has received numerous awards, including the 2013 Excellence in Research in Teaching and Teacher Education Award from the Teacher and Teacher Education Division of the American Educational Research Association and the Outstanding Publication Award for Linking Research and Practice from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. She has also served in a number of leadership roles at Northwestern University, including Director of Undergraduate Education and Associate Dean for Teacher Education. After the talk, we will have time for questions, and when the time comes, we ask that you post your questions in the chat, and we will get to as many as we can. Thank you again for joining us, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Sharon. Thanks so much, Shira. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I just want to start by saying that I appreciate you all being here today. We have such serious challenges facing us at this moment, uh, the pandemic, um, the increased violence, uh, over racism, increasing risks to voter protections, just as an election is coming up. And so being in community together uh, at this time really means a lot. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, I will share my screen and we will get started. Great, so I'm gonna talk about um, some research that I've been doing uh, as Shira said, uh, using video to study, develop, and support teacher noticing. Um, and let me see here. So um, a few hundred years ago, the microscope was invented. And one thing that people did was to put all sorts of things under the microscope and look at them. And it really revolutionized uh, parts of science. Uh, you could look at things that you could never look at before. And these are some drawings from Robert Hooke's book, which appeared in 1665. On the left is his observation of a flea, and on the right, a thin slice of cork. And you can just imagine the excitement of seeing something for the first time that we just couldn't see before. Now, of course, there's been a more recent invention that's revolutionized parts of social science research that's concerned with human behavior, and that is video. So in the late 1960s, video cameras became more portable and less costly, and the applications to social science research were really far reaching. And among the many uses, videotaping in classrooms um, became quite popular. And I think it makes sense, right? The power of video was sort of that it allows you to freeze time and go slowly through human behavior on the, on the order of seconds to minutes. And this is exactly the time scale and kind of phenomena that one finds in a classroom. And what I think is interesting is that even early on, video wasn't just seen as a way for researchers to study classrooms, but there was a sense that video would be a valuable tool for teachers. So teachers could get a better sense of what happens in a classroom. And I think intuitively, this seems like a good idea, right? Video captures much of the richness of classroom interactions and, and doesn't require teachers to respond immediately. But I think there's still a pretty big step to take to understand sort of what's the right thing to do with teachers with video. And that brings me to, um, to the questions I wanna talk about today. First question is, um, what, 
what should we do with teachers around video and for what purpose, right? What might video help teachers learn? Second question, um, can interactions with video influence teacher practice? This might be the most important question we ask. Does, inter does interacting with video matter for instruction? And finally, how might recording one's own classroom be valuable for teachers? Given all the changes in recording technologies, um, I think it's helpful to, to think of this also. So let's jump into this first question. Um, what uh, might video help teachers learn? And I'm gonna claim is that video is particularly well suited to the development of teacher noticing. So rather than helping to develop, for example, subject matter knowledge or pedagogical content knowledge, I think video is really good for helping teachers look closely and pay attention in new ways. And as I said already, um, central to the idea of using video with teachers is this idea that it provides an opportunity for reflection rather than action, right? A student's question doesn't have the same urgency, doesn't require an immediate response the way it does in, interact, in, uh, in instruction. And also video serves as a permanent record. It can be viewed repeatedly um, from different perspectives if someone wants. A video can also be edited and annotated. Um, so it's not just a static record of the classroom. Uh, if you want, you can uh, look at a student from the beginning of the year, right at, at up at a moment of the student later in the year. So a lot of a lot of options that I think give teachers a new way to look at classroom interaction. So rather than taking my word for it, I thought we would start by doing a few noticing tasks together. So I'm going to flash a sentence on the screen for five seconds, and I'm going to ask you to count the number of F's in the screen, the letter F. So here we go. Okay, so if you don't mind, go ahead and put in the chat how many F's you saw. Let's see, is there a chat? Yes. Okay, so some people saw six, five, three, four, two, different. So we all know what an F is. So it's a little strange that there would be different numbers of Fs that we would see. So let's try it again. I'm going to flash it up again. Five seconds. Here we go. Okay, can you put the number in the chat again? How many you saw this time? Brett still sees six. Somebody says seven, three. So a few different. Okay, let's go back and look. Um, you can unmute yourself if you want, whoever wants to, and tell us where you see the Fs. Someone gonna be brave enough to do that? I see. Oh, go ahead. No, that's okay. Go ahead. Is that Yvonne? Yeah. Okay. Where's your first F? My first F is a capital F and finished. That's one. The second word files. Got it. Two. At the end of the line in of. Of. Tricky. And yep. Then the second line, there's another of. Yep. Then I originally missed this F in scientific. Uh-huh. And then the last of at the last and the fourth line. Great, great. Thanks. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Yvonne. So um, this is something, a little activity I learned from Chris Bean at the University of Cape Town. But the point is that um, we can look at the same thing, but we might not see the same thing, right? We all know what an F looks like. We all probably now agree that there were six Fs, but seeing noticing is an active process. Uh, this is a, a quote I love from Frick, Fred Erickson where he says, teacher noticing is active, not passive, and involves constructing what is seen. So noticing involves constructing meaning from what we observe. Okay, now we're gonna do another activity. I'm gonna show you, um, a short video of some people uh, playing basketball. And there are some people who have white t-shirts on, and there are some teachers who have, uh, people who have dark colored t-shirts. And I'm gonna ask you to count how many passes um, the people with the white t-shirts make, and they could do like a chess pass from one to the other, or a bounce pass. It's a short video, 
but we're going to go ahead and count the number of passes that they make. Okay, here we go. Okay, great. So can you put in the chat how many um, basketball passes you saw? You counted? 18, 19, 17, 20, 27. So a range. Anybody see anything unusual in the video? A puppet running across. A puppet dressed as? Dressed as a gorilla, perhaps? Yes. Did anyone not see the gorilla? Josh, does that mean you did not see the gorilla? OK, so you've seen this before. Did anyone? Let's put it this way. Is, is there anyone who's, who's watching this video for the first time? Me. Yeah. OK, Tabitha, yeah. I know Wendy saw the gorilla. Tabitha, did you see it? Yeah. Did anyone not see it? Yay, is that Rose? Okay, Rose, do you yeah, I, I believe that there's a girl. I just wasn't okay. paying attention to the girl. I was paying that's attention the, to the basketball. That's the point. That's exactly the point. You did not expect to see a gorilla. I was asking you to count carefully. You were a good student paying attention, but we'll just show you so you can see this. Here comes the gorilla standing front and center. So after you see the gorilla, it's a bit shocking to think maybe that you didn't see it. And again, so the point here is that our expectations drive what we, per what we perceive, right? We wouldn't expect to see a gorilla in the middle of the basketball game. I didn't ask you to look for that. Um, and in fact, sometimes we don't even see that. Um, this is a, a quote, um, what the teacher sees in the world is strongly driven by knowledge and expectation. So noticing is really driven by our expectations. Perception notices this really interesting thing. And just one more activity and then we'll move on. Is there someone who'd be willing to unmute themselves and read this out loud? I'll start. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Um, it's very misspelled, but I can still get the gist of it. Um, according to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and the last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Yvonne, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. So what is going on there? Um, we can make sense of things even when we don't have all the details, as in this example, right? Noticing involves broadening and narrowing our focus. So with the gorilla, we almost had to broaden our lens to see something that wasn't expected. And with the sentence, uh, the, the, the paragraph that Yvonne just read, we almost had to narrow our view and just focus on certain things, the first and the last letters, um, to make sense of it. And uh, Kevin Miller talks about expert noticing being distinguished not only by what we attend to, what we pay attention to, by, but what we choose not to pay attention to. And I'd claim that in deciphering that letters, we have to sort of not pay attention to all the details and just look at the gist of things. So it's this broadening and narrowing um, that's so important. So, um, so let's go on now. Um, Okay, so classrooms, of course, are complex environments with many things happen simultaneously. So teaching involves deciding where and how to focus one's attention. Um, and when I think of teacher noticing, I like to think of a, a little model I use. Um, 
where I think of teacher noticing is made up of two processes. On the one hand, we have selective attention, right, which is what it is that stands out to the teacher. And on the other hand, we have knowledge based reasoning. So once a teacher's attention is drawn to an event, the teacher's going to reason about that event based on his or her knowledge and understanding. And these processes interact dynamically. So what stands out to a teacher is going to influence the reasoning that takes place, but also a teacher's knowledge and expectations are going to influence um, what that teacher perceives. Um, so this kind of in the moment noticing this attention and reasoning about key features of instruction, I think really requires a great deal of expertise on the part of teacher. And, um, and again, my claim is that it's the kind of expertise that I think video can help us notice. Okay, so I'm going to go on now to my second question. Can interactions with video influence teacher practice during instruction? So this is something we've been um, we've been studying using video clubs and a video club is really a group of teachers that get together to share and discuss excerpts of videos from their classroom. So instead of a book club, um, they're looking, they are the text they're looking at is a video. And so when I'm studying the development of teacher noticing in video clubs, what I'm going to be studying are changes in teacher selective attention and teachers knowledge based reasoning going back to that that model I have. So I, I'll give you an example. Um, one uh, study we did was with the Mapleton elementary school uh, uh, elementary video club. It was seven elementary school teachers. They met uh, once or twice a month across the school year and a researcher would actually go into the classroom videotape the teachers classroom and uh, select the clips to show often talking to the teacher about what they might show but imagine um, it is the, uh, the teacher, uh, the researcher who's mainly picking the clips and then facilitating the, the meetings, asking um, uh, general questions like, what do you notice? And more specific questions about the, what was in the video. Um, and we really were focusing on, um, on noticing students' math thinking. And so some of the questions were, you know, what are students saying here? What does this student mean? How do these two students' ideas, things like that. Um, and the meetings were uh, videotaped and transcribed and uh, discussions were divided up into the idea units, these segments in which a particular idea was discussed. Um, and then each of these idea units was coded in different ways. The actor, so who is the focus of the conversation at the time? The topic, were teachers talking about math thinking? Were they talking about pedagogy, climate or management? We also looked at the stance teachers used to discuss uh, what was in the video. Were they sort of describing what was saying, evaluating it, saying it's good or bad, or interpreting it in some way? And then we also, if they were talking about student thinking, uh, we looked at the strategy teachers used to explore those ideas. And in terms of, um, of teacher noticing, we can think of these first two actor and topic as uh, being related to second selective attention and stance and this strategy uh, used to um, to explore student ideas. Great, and I realize I'm so sorry. I just see these comments in the chat now about our um, our activities before. Keep putting things in the chat. I'll try to uh, pay attention to that, and also feel free to unmute yourself at any point if you have a a question or comment. Okay, so what did we find? Um, I thought I would just show you two short video clips to give you a sense of what took place. So let's make sure the sound is working here. Dr. Sharon, I'm sorry, are, are we supposed to be hearing it? Is the sound not working? It's not working, but I think what you do is... Oh, I know how to optimize my sound, but I think I have to stop sharing for a minute, yes? That may be true. Maybe somebody knows um, more than I do. Here, I'm going to try it again. I think you have to allow the, allow the sound sharing. I'm going to try it again. But I realized I didn't set it up anyway. It's not that it's not that critical that you hear. But this uh, clip comes the very first video club meeting. 
Teachers were watching a clip where students are working on different strategies for adding and subtracting decimals. Um, the facilitator, the researcher stopped the video and said, what do you notice? And this is the first thing a teacher says. So interrupt me again. Let's see if you can hear it this time. I like that they were using dry erase. I think that makes it more interesting as you're doing a few problems on the board. I think always just watching someone else is, you know, you kind of check out. Some of the kids do, they stop paying attention. And when it's paper and pencil, they sometimes... So using the little I slate think it was boards. probably kept attention more. It was kind of fun, maybe. So this teacher is talking about these um, small individual slate boards that she had students using. And sorry, I keep turning my head because you're over there on my screen, even though I know like I'm looking here, but whatever, you'll forgive me. Um, she's talking about climate, right? What makes students interested, engaged, excited to learn, and this pedagogical method of using these slate boards rather than paper and pencil. Now, the second clip I want to show you comes from uh, a meeting near the end of the year. And as this video starts, you're going to hear the video that the teachers are watching in the background. Um, so the, the video is actually playing, and, and here's what's happening. Number B is $10. Number B is $10. Bethany, B is $10. Yes, it is. Will you tell us? Yeah. So I don't know if you can tell what's happening, but you can sort of hear this video in the background. And then we have these teachers on the left-hand side who are looking at the transcript and talking to each other. And they're saying, um, you know, wait, I'm not sure what she's saying. Where's this number coming from? What is she saying? And so it's a very, it's a very uh, different than the beginning of the meeting. Here they are really, even in the midst of viewing the video clip, starting to investigate what the student says, really initiating discussions of student thinking. And the researcher who's facilitating the um, discussion actually stops the video and says, hey, will you tell me what, what's going on? What are you thinking? So, um, so that's just a glimpse inside, but let me tell you what happened across the club. First, in terms of selective attention, there was a shift in what the teachers noticed. Initially, the teachers raised issues of pedagogy and climate most often, but over time, they increased their focus on student thinking. And this pattern was apparent both when looking at the number of teacher-initiated idea units for each topic, so they brought up student thinking more often, but it was also apparent when looking at the total time spent discussing student thinking. So no matter whether it was a teacher or a researcher who raised an issue of student thinking, teachers' discussions of these issues increased in length. And in terms of knowledge-based reasoning, we also saw changes, a shift in how student thinking was discussed. So in the early video club, teachers didn't just respond to a researcher's prompt um, sometimes they would, you know, we would say, what does the student mean? And they would change the subject completely. I, I want to talk about this other thing, which is fine. Um, uh, sometimes they would quote student statements. Uh, John says it's B, Amy says it's C. But in the later video clubs, teachers really engaged in analysis of student ideas and synthesis across idea, uh, moving from description and evaluation to interpreting. So, so we had the sense that the video club did help develop teachers noticing, at least in the context of watching these video clips in the club. But then we wondered, as I asked earlier, you know, did teachers noticing change in ways that would be visible during instruction? So that was the next thing we wanted to look at. Um, and to do this, we, um, I, I want to mention that our wording of did, did we see similar changes in teacher noticing during instruction is important because it wasn't that we were looking for this huge grand shift. Teachers taught in this way and then we're going to see teachers uh, teaching in this other way. Instead, we're looking for evidence of a very particular sort. Did teachers selective attention develop as it had in the video club? Were they paying more attention to student ideas? And did knowledge-based reasoning shift? Were they using this kind of strategies we saw in the video club in their classrooms? So that's what we were looking at. Um, and the way we did this is we observed, remember there were just seven teachers. So we did uh, a range of observations across the year. 
and we decided to focus our analysis on whole class discussion. We thought that was a place where we might be able to see um, if and how teachers were attending to student math thinking. So we took each whole class discussion and we segmented it into two minute intervals. It sort of seemed like a good coding unit for us long enough to include substantive interactions, but not so long uh, that, we, that we couldn't handle that. And we identified both confirming and disconfirming evidence of teachers noticing student thinking. Um, and we identified confirming and disconfirming evidence of teachers reasoning about student thinking also. And um, you know, if a teacher noted that a student's idea was correct or not, we would say, okay, well, they noticed student thinking, but they weren't uh, attending to it in a very sophisticated way. Um, and uh, we had two researchers who worked on this uh, analysis together and had um, iterator reliability was quite strong. Okay, so what did we find? Um, in terms of selective attention, just as in the video club setting, teachers paid more attention to student thinking during instruction later in the year. Um, for example, early in the year, students in Mr. Novak's class were working on comparing fractions. Um, and on the overhead were like pictures of different rectangles divided into different numbers of segments. And the class is trying to find out which is bigger, one third or three eighths. And the teacher says, okay, how do I find three eighths, Nina? And she says, mm. and the teacher says, that's okay, Sam. And the student says, count to three. And the teacher says, okay, what do we do to find one third and go on? So even though we might have wondered what Sam meant, right? Count to three, where, which three? The teacher sort of accepts the answer and moves on. And this sort of moving the lesson on, really not seeing the student's comment as something that needs thinking on the part of the teacher, that was pretty common early on. And then later in the year, the teacher more explicitly commented during instruction that a student's idea was interesting or confusion. So in one example, students at the board showing an invented method for 8.0 um, times 0.2. They're working with decibels. And the teacher's looking at what the students, and she says, I'm interested. I've never heard of that. I'd like to know how that came out, but I'm not sure I'm following it. So really trying to make sense of, um, of what the student is doing. And, and looking across all seven teachers, don't worry, I know this is like a, a big table, but let me just give you the overview, which is um, we identified this kind of disconfirming evidence on the left-hand side here, uh, frequently early in the year, there was a lot of disconfirming evidence that teachers were sort of treating students' objects as inquiry, student thinking as inquiry, where in the later in the year, it was much more common for there to be confirming evidence. There was still disconfirming evidence. It wasn't, you know, every single moment teachers are treating student thinking as objects of inquiry, but it was much more frequent for them to do so. Um, I'm gonna pause for a second because Oh, I see a question, but we will go on. Okay, so um, so let's look at what happened with uh, knowledge-based reasoning during instruction. Okay, so interestingly, we did see the teachers begin to apply strategies for interpreting student thinking during instruction, much as they had in the video club. And it's we didn't ask them to do this. We didn't say, hey, have this great discussion, now take it back to your classroom and use it. It was just sort of a natural progression for the teachers. So early in the video club, um, teachers often responded to students saying, that's not the right answer, does someone else wanna try it? Or just restating what a student had done, Ashley divided the hexagon into five triangles. But later in the, observa in the observations, um, later in the year, teachers really considered the meaning of students' ideas, and there was evidence that they wanted to understand students' method. Uh, a teacher would said, stop, what do you mean, since there's two things behind the line? Or, now these two approaches seem different, sort of making comparisons among students. And again, looking across all seven teachers, this is what we found. So, this table talks about the number of two-minute segments and the strategies teacher used for reading. And I'm sorry I'm not in front of you to sort of point at this, but um, as you can see that early, in the early observations, most frequent was either to not really reason about student ideas or to restate student ideas. A little bit of exploring the meaning of student ideas. 
where later we see most common was either restating student ideas, but a lot of this exploring meaning of student ideas and even some generalizing or synthesizing. So overall, their strategies got much more sophisticated over the course of the year. And, you know, uh, we're clearly cautious about, cautious about this data. There were only seven teachers in the study, um, but it was still pretty striking to see that without prompting from the researchers, the teachers sort of took the strategies from the video club and were able to use them in their classrooms. Okay, so we've seen that working with video can help teachers learn uh, and develop their noticing practices in ways that influence instruction. Now I wanna shift gears a bit and tell you about this last question, which is how might recording one's own classroom be valuable for teachers? So we're really in the midst of a, a video uh, technology revolution, right? We have these tiny uh, video cameras. They're small, they're widely available. Uh, video can be captured in digital files, which can be immediately uploaded. And there's a wide variety of tools for working with and sharing video. So teachers don't need very much in terms of special equipment to be able to capture, view videos from their classrooms, share them with others. And the upshot is that I think the use of video with, te with teachers by teachers is gonna change dramatically in the next few years. And so I think we wanna think carefully about how to use video effectively in, in that context for teachers, keeping in mind what we want teachers to learn as a result that we think it's good for noticing. So um, one of the questions I wanna ask is where and when does learning to notice take place? I think much of the work around video-based um, professional development especially around noticing, assumes that learning to notice happens in conversation with peers around video, right? So we curate these videos for teachers, we show it to them and they talk to their peers and that's where the learning happens. But, but what if that's not the only place? What if learning to notice happens as a result of preparing to and capturing video in um, one's classroom? So I wanna tell you about quickly about two studies that I did, the first one, is a study uh, I did with Elizabeth Dyer, who now is at Middle State, uh, Middle Tennessee University. In this study, um, 14 middle and high school teachers were asked to capture and select clips of student math thinking in their own classrooms. We gave them these little handheld cameras and they reported their experiences to researchers. And we found that teachers used different strategies sort of across time periods. Uh, in the capture and selection proce process. So they did some things when they were planning for capture, during and after. And uh, it was sort of like a three phase process. So let me tell you about that. So um, interestingly, there was evidence of teacher learning in each of these phases. So um, what we noticed was that um, when teachers were planning to prepare, planning to capture video. One thing they did was they tried to anticipate where student thinking was gonna happen. So they would say, okay, I'm gonna be teaching the, um, the uh, I don't know what they would be teaching. They were teaching some geometry lesson on uh, similar triangles tomorrow. And they might say, where in this lesson is the place that I'm gonna see student thinking? Because they didn't just want to record a whole lesson they wanted to just record a part of a lesson where they thought student thinking was. So there was this anticipating student thinking. And then also they sort of prepared themselves to notice. Teachers would tell us, I'm gonna be looking for if students talk about this or that. So that was interesting, we didn't expect that. And then during capture, there were also two things that happened. One was this focused noticing, building on their preparing to notice. Now they're like, really their noticing is heightened. Um, they would say things like, I'm paying more attention because I'm videotaping this moment. I really wanna see what happens. And sometimes teachers would adjust their instruction. They would say, I'm gonna let this conversation go on longer to make sure there's some student thinking that's happening. So they're sort of attending to what's happening in, in a maybe a different way. And finally, after capture, there was what we're calling reflective noticing where they would say, huh, I think I wish I would have picked this other clip because that's where student thinking was happening in the moment. And they would also, of course, review the clips and decide whether there was student thinking present. 
Um, so we have some evidence from these comments from teacher that there was learning taking place, but we didn't really have a way to see what was happening. And this brings me to the next study where we were asking, how do teachers go about videotaping in their classrooms? How do teachers determine which components of lessons to record? And how do they select video excerpts to share with colleagues? This is work I've been doing with several colleagues at Northwestern University, Jen Richards, Mari Outschuler, Bruce Sharon, Sarah Larison, and Tracy Doby, who is now at the University of Utah. Um, so there were 20 elementary school teachers and we asked them to capture and select clips of student thinking during a set of particular math argumentation tasks. The tasks, in fact, were part of a curriculum developed by uh, our colleagues at the University of Washington. One was which one doesn't belong. Um, there were a variety of tasks. Um, teachers then shared uh, these clips with colleagues in an online platform. Uh, we were actually using teaching channels uh, platform at the time. And researchers, we actually observed teachers during the recording process. We would watch them when they recorded. And then teachers recorded themselves as they selected video, as they like edited their clips um, to just to make it, as they edited their video to make a clip to share. And we gave them some uh, suggestions, make the clip three to four minutes, things like that. So, um, so what did we find here? So, First, over time, teachers experimented uh, with a range of strategies for capturing video during instruction. Um, in terms of students, teachers focused a lot on what students would be experiencing. First, the students who they would be recording, would they be comfortable, would they understand the task, things like that. But they were also concerned about students who weren't being recorded. Do, do the rest of my students have something to do? Will they be occupied? Which makes sense, right? I mean, teaching is complex as it is, and now we're asking them to record while they're teaching. Um, and the teachers also had uh, paid a, thought about um, what should be in the video frame. Um, they paid attention to where the camera was going to be placed. Could they see the students? Could they see the student work? Um, and, and over time, they increasingly focused on um, could they see where students were pointed? Could they see how students were interacting with objects and with each other? And as you can imagine, there was a bit of a tension between this attention to student experience and attention to the placement of the camera. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of screenshots. Um, so this teacher on the left in her early capture, she has the, um, the camera actually facing the students so she can see the students' faces in the video screen. And later she decided to put it in the back and she talked about how she was sorry she couldn't see their faces, but she thought it was important to see what was on the board and what students were talking about. And sometimes a student would go up to the board or point. Uh, here's, here's another teacher, oops. So this teacher, she started with her phone. You can see it on the left-hand side on the table. And over time, she thought, well, the phone wasn't that practical when she wanted to upload the video and share it with her colleagues. It was easier if it was on a computer. But when she switched the computer, she found it very distracting for the students that they would see themselves on the screen. So I don't know if you can see it. I'm sorry, again, I'm not in person to point, but inside this red circle here, there's a little piece of paper she used to cover the screen. So it didn't cover the camera. So again, teachers were very thoughtful and intentional in ways that we had no idea how much thinking goes into this idea of capturing the video. Um, so, um, so that's some of what we found. Uh, after recording, um, teachers were asked to um, edit their videos and to select clips to share with colleagues. And at this point, their primary attention was on the student thinking in the video. So for example, the teacher says she's watching the clip and she says, oh, I love how he says it depends on what you're asking. I love that. I'm going to go back, back in the video because I want to highlight all of these different things. And they're talking about patterns and arrays and how many shapes there are. So that gives us some insight into how she's deciding what to pick. Another teacher says, but the end, I feel like once one kid was talking, the other two were not listening at all. So she doesn't want to show that clip where students aren't listening to each other. Um, clearly, this, 
this generating video clips is complex work for teachers, right? And there's a tension between attending to student considerations and video considerations. Another tension teachers talked about is between good teaching and good video. There was a sense that, that um, from the researchers that a good video is a video where there's something to talk about, right? Something that we wanna figure out or an interesting student idea. Maybe when students aren't understanding something, that's one of the most interesting moments in a video clip. But the teachers felt that good teaching was showing that students clearly understood the tasks and clearly had, had the correct answers and things like that. So that was a tension to work out. Um, teachers did prioritize student thinking and teachers comments really did suggest that this work promoted learning to notice as they were thinking about what they were seeing and making sense of as they were doing this work. Um, and, and just to wrap up, um, I want to just refer to this idea that John Mason talks about that I love. He calls it awareness of awareness that as teachers are learning to notice they're both noticing and becoming conscious of aware of their notice. And here's a couple quotes from uh, teachers we worked with that I think give us the sense of awareness of awareness. One teacher said, I need to let students talk more. This is after she watched a video from her classroom. I could have bounced Anthony's questions back to the class. I'm doing too much of the talking and thinking. Another teacher says, I did this, I did this one just on a whim one day and I'm like, oh, we need to stop and record this because they got so into it. And I was just like so intrigued by their understanding. So here's a case where a teacher's not videotaping, but she seems to be attending to what's happening in instruction with a level, with a threshold of, oh, this is something interesting. This is worth attending to, paying attention to. And finally, um, this a teacher says, knowing I was trying to record student thinking made me more aware of whether it was happening. Again, this heightened awareness. So I hope that gives you a sense of some of the kind of work that I've been, been doing. Um, and I'm just gonna stop sharing and open it up for any questions. You can put questions in the chat, you can unmute, whatever is easiest for yourselves. And now I can actually look at you. Thank you, I see your emojis, thank you. Um, any work with pre-service teachers, okay. So thanks, Fred, for that question. So um, we have done a series of work with pre-service teachers around the self-captured video. And you can imagine when we ask pre-service teachers to go capture video from their classrooms, they usually, I mean, come back, ca capture student thinking in video in their classrooms. They often come back and say that what I thought was gonna be student thinking was not student thinking. So they might have captured, you know, a discussion or what they thought was a discussion and realized they were doing much of the talking or um, there was very little probing of student ideas. So that's one of the interesting things we found with student thinking uh, with, with pre-service teachers. We also have had pre-service teachers capture video clips, uh, you know, in different weeks from their student um, teaching experience and go back and reflect on those. And uh, that seems to help them become more aware of their growth as teachers. And that's been a nice thing to see. Please go ahead, jump, just uh, jump right in. Okay, uh, so I work with pre-service teachers and uh, so usually uh, what they, um, they have different uh, models that they have to show some proficiency with. So maybe it's how do you work with students in group or group work and um, and so their focus sometimes is more on that. I'm just wondering, you know, how the focus is on, you know, things that you're, you're looking at, noticing and, you know, uh, the thinking of the students. And um, I'm trying to think about how that, and I think that's the most important <laughs> aspect more than just, you know, the group work. Um, how, you know, how do you formulate it, how you manage it, that kind of thing. So pre-service teachers, I know they want to see structure 
uh, is very important. But what is your experience in terms of the things that, uh, you know, how do you merge those two things together? That the structure of managing the students along with, you know, focusing on, on it, their thinking. Mm -hmm. in, in non, um, in non COVID times, we usually start by having um, the pre-service teachers do a tour of their classroom on video, mm -hmm. you know, to pick up part of their classroom. So they are comfortable with videotaping and giving some attention to their classroom. And then the second thing we do is have them work with an individual student, which I think is what you're saying that, um, you know, the complexity of working with many students at once, I think is a huge challenge, but the skills are, are many of the same as you work with an individual student with a group of students. And I think videotaping, you know, whether you're, we, we often ask um, students to do a, um, an interview with a student around a substantive task, a math task or a science or reading. And, um, and then when they watch that, they can sort of take the time to unpack the student thinking, maybe in a way they didn't do in the moment of teaching, and then move up to groups from there. I, I don't know, it sounds like that's what you're already thinking, yes? Well, see, our students have to video uh, at, at least seven times, and they have to you know, video the, the lesson, at least half of the lesson. So that's, and then they upload it to Athena, and and then we have a discussion. We watch each other's video, and uh, but a lot of the because say that the uh, main reason for say a lesson is to see mm -hmm. how do you get students into groups. We're watching them do this, mm -hmm. and and how do you you know um, how do you um, uh, talk about what are the main things you want the student mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. achieve. Uh, and then they start working and they have the video, video and the students talking mm -hmm. uh, as they're working in the groups and they go around and, and they do, so they have this kind of opening and then uh, they start working with at least four students uh, per group mm -hmm. uh, at a time. Um, so, but um, I'm looking, I'm thinking about the rubric and all of that that we yeah. use and it's not a lot of focus on okay, now you have them in a the group, now they're talking to each other, you know, what else are they, you're noticing that they're doing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that might be something interesting to think about. I mean, I always find the biggest shift is from getting pre-service teachers away from looking at themselves on the video and looking at their students on okay. the video. Right. And, you know, you may even want to ask them to videotape something that they're not in. So there's no chance they're going to attend to them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Of course. I see a question in the chat. I do love Athena. We use Athena at Northwestern also. Um, how much scaffolding versus discovery do you recommend with your video clubs? I'm, I'm pretty darn explicit in the video club that we are going to talk about student thinking and try to prompt very openly questions. What is the student saying? What do you think is going on here? Things like that. Um, but uh, I find by like the second video club, people get the hang of it and start to do it. Um, you know, I mean, there's always other issues that teachers want to bring up. And I think it's critical to give space for that also. But I think if you explain why you're focusing on student thinking, what the goal is, you know, I mean, yeah. It is not an easy shift for experienced teachers. They think they should talk about what they are doing. And, you know, I understand that because we think we have big impact on students and we do, but that's why I think what video can help you is to shift that view and say, what are we seeing about students? What can we learn from looking at that? It's not that what we do as teachers isn't important. It's just, we can also learn from this other perspective. Okay, to what degree the progress of getting to know students that impacts changes in teachers increase focus? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great question, um, Kimberly, which is um, how might a teacher's attention to students change over the course of the year as teachers get to know students? 
oh, I think there's so many possibilities, right? On the one hand, we might think that as teachers get to know students, they're gonna do a better job of being able to uh, attend to and make sense of student thinking. On the other hand, we might think that they are going to um, rely more on their preconceived notions of what students are capable of or, or what they're expecting from a student. So uh, I think that would be a great study. I encourage you to do that, do that study and let me know what you find. Are there creative ways teachers use the video noticing activity that surprised you? Oh, yes, so many things teachers did. Um, let's think of what teachers did that really surprised me. Um, the teachers who said that um, they changed the way they taught in the moment of instruction, that was very surprising to me, like that they extended the conversation because they wanted to make sure there was student thinking or they probed a little more. You know, it made me think is all we need to do give teachers a camera and, you know, we're going to be paying more attention to student thinking. I think the other thing that really surprised me is how much attention teachers gave to where they placed the camera. You know, teachers placed it, you know, sort of looking at students and then realized, well, they couldn't do student work. So then they would tip it over and, and be able to see students, um, you know, what students were working on and then covering up so students wouldn't see the camera. I mean, they were very inventive, but I think that's the nature of teaching is, is to be inventive and make changes. Um, your experienced teachers sometimes were less apt to focus on student thinking. Going back to Kim's question, that is true. It is, that is true. Experienced teachers sometimes had their uh, predefined ways of attending to student thinking, so they had more to unlearn. I mean, there's differences between pre-service and in-service teachers, I think, and uh, the resources they bring to bear to student thinking. I'm sorry, this chat thing is, is great because the questions can be coming, but then like, I'm the only one who's speaking and that's tedious. So feel free to, to bring in your own voice. I have a question. I'm wondering, um, thank you for your talk. I'm wondering what opportunities you see for this outside of teacher education. Um, so like, could professors record themselves? Could undergraduate students record themselves? Um, and so the opportunities, but also like, what would be challenging to take this outside of the, the teacher education context? Mm -hmm. There has been some work done in, in, at the university level with this uh, by my colleague, Natasha Spear who um, I'm trying to think of the institution she's at in Maine, I'm not sure. Um, my sense is that definitely it can be used for college level instruction. I think um, many uh, colleges have sort of recording options for teachers and part of like a center for teaching excellence, that kind of thing. But I think this question you're raising about students is really interesting, you know. Um, what would it look like for a teacher and a student to capture a moment and to talk about what they experienced? And how would that be a way to share very different perspectives in a context that you know, might, be, um, might be safe and comfortable? I think one thing we don't talk about enough is that video always has perspective. Sometimes we think, oh, a video of a classroom, it's just like, a, you know, it's the truth, it's what happened, but it's not true. You know, it always focuses on the faces or doesn't focus on the faces or the back of the room or the side of the room. And those choices highlight some aspects of what's visible in a classroom and obscure others. So I think those are really good ideas, Wendy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Where do you see research about teacher noticing moving from here? Um, Gosh, lots of questions. I think, um, I mean, I really do think that teachers recording in their classroom is gonna just keep going and become more and more. And so I think if we wanna think about how to harness that capability for a way that we think is gonna improve opportunities for students learning and help teachers manage their jobs, effectively, I think that would be a really good thing to do. The other thing I think that we're already seeing in the teacher noticing work is moving away from student thinking as the thing we should focus on. 
and expanding to other issues, particularly around power, around access to ideas, um, around authority in the classroom. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's hard work to see something that you don't know what it looks like. And so I think that's a thing that people are taking up very, uh, in very interesting ways. Um, a number of colleagues, Naral Shah and um, many others. It's, it's pretty interesting work. So I think that's important. Can you spell out that name for me, please? And uh, actually I can just put it in the chat. Thank you. Naral Shah is doing that. Oh, thank you. I was gonna say, Camille Dominguez. Who else, Yasmin, should we put in there? Um, there's, if you go to one of those articles, I think they'll, yeah, lead you to others. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. Yeah, Nicole Louie, that's a great one. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, that is the question. Nicholas, that is literally the question. Um, you know, in some ways, I think that remote learning provides many opportunities to record. If you're teaching on Zoom, you just press a button to record. And it even does a lot of transcribing of the video for you also. Um, so I think that's great. I also think it could open up opportunities for teachers to see each other's classroom uh, in ways that maybe aren't possible before. I think right now though, the lift for um, teaching is so great that I'm not sure that um, there is really um, the, uh, I, I can't think of the right word, not tendency, but really the interest uh, in doing that, but um, I, I need to think more about that. Nicholas, do you have some ideas about that? Or maybe others do? Well, that's a good, a good thing for us to think about. Thank you so much for uh, letting me join you this afternoon. Great. Um, so let's all give a, a big thank you to Dr. Sharon. That was a really wonderful um, lecture and Please join us um, for the next speaker in the speaker series. Um, so in, um, on October 27th, we have uh, Dr. Goenfield coming um, and you can sign up at the same link uh, that you used before. So thanks so much.